Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Rick Garza, director of the Liquor and Cannabis Board in Washington State. Uh, I'll begin with only seven minutes. I'll begin by stating that uh, the model that was used in Washington, and again, the initiative was passed in November of 2012, is modeled around the model that was used coming out of prohibition in 1934. It's interesting that the author of the initiative looked at how we came out of prohibition, very strict requirements for licensure to make sure we keep the criminal element out, uh, policies and, and rules and laws with respect to youth access. Uh, and so I'll share that uh, as the first two states uh, in 2012, we waited nine months to hear from the federal government as to whether they were going to allow us to move forward with this experiment, knowing that it defied the prohibition federally. The Cole Memorandum was provided nine months later in August of 2013. It really is the guiding principles around which we set up our regulations. And there are three areas, and one was just uh, we had some detail from the doctor from Alaska, but I, I would say because of the committee's work, I want to I want to focus on the uh, restricting youth access piece. So we do compliance checks as a liquor regulator in Washington and have for over 80 years. We are using the same program in Washington for cannabis retailers. It's interesting that the initiative set up the same program. In fact, the model for alcohol regulation in Washington is modeled after British Columbia to our north. Uh, but we do compliance checks in Washington, three to four compliance checks for each retailer a year. We have tight security requirements and penalties uh, for sales. The youth compliance rate uh, the last four years in Washington has been about 92%. That's even better than the compliance that rate that we have uh, for alcohol retailers, which is somewhere between 84, 84 and 90%. And the reason why we're doing better with respect to cannabis we have fewer retailers. So we actually used also the same model. Uh, until 2011, the state was the retailer of spirits, similar to the way that Canada and some of the provinces uh, retail uh, alcohol. And so we use that same model. We only allow 500 retail stores statewide with a population, as you're aware of, over uh, 7 million. Uh, but we do uh, many compliance checks uh, per year. Also, we were about six months behind Colorado, and we saw some of the things that were happening with respect to edibles and infused products. The board, by emergency rule, adopted a rule that stated that no edibles or infused products could be especially appealing to children. Little did we know that in the black market and gray market of medical, uh, many infused uh, and edible products were appealing to children, gummy bears, lollipops, cotton candy, ice cream. Uh, so we actually wrote an emergency rule. We have a four-person committee at the Liquor and Cannabis Board that reviews all packaging and labeling and product uh, for edibles and infused, and uh, that has kept some of the bright colors and things that we saw in the black and gray market uh, out of our market. I think there was a question earlier or a comment about what have we seen in the last four years with respect to youth use. Uh, in Washington, we have what's called the Healthy Youth Survey. It's done every other year, eighth graders, 10th graders, 12th graders in our high schools. And we ask one basic question throughout that is, uh, use in the last 30 days. We're very interested in looking what, uh, what would happen there. We were expecting to see uh, the health community, prevention community, a significant or at least an increase in those uh, eighth and 10th graders uh, with respect to use in the last 30 days. Uh, in 2012, it was 17%. Uh, in 2016, it was 17%. And so I think we were surprised and the prevention community and the health community was surprised to see that there wasn't a significant increase. And in fact, in some counties south of uh, in South Washington uh, actually decreases, uh, which we don't really understand. The one area of concern in the survey was the perception of harm had gone down. Uh, and, and, and again, typically what you'll see is, when that happens is there you would expect to see an increase in use, but we didn't see that. But I'll share with you because there's so much 
anecdotal information uh, with respect to the harms or not harms, depending upon whether you, uh, whether you're a, an opponent or not of legalization. Uh, the Healthy Youth Survey has been uh, out in the communities and in the schools for over 50 years, and we use that as a benchmark to determine use not only of cannabis, um, but of all drugs. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, share um, something that's been interesting, and, I'll, and maybe I'll look at my time here, but um, I think one of the things that we didn't expect was the clash of the cultures. So I'll share with you that the initiative passed 56 to 44 percent. So there's a sizable population in Washington that voted no. Uh, I think some of the things that we didn't expect that we saw that I would share with you is advertising. Um, and there was a real clash there between those who had now finally seen that uh, legalization had occurred, uh, that the industry was advertising uh, as anyone would advertise a product. And I think there was a real clash uh, with citizens that led to this last two years, restrictions in advertising uh, by the legislature and signed by the governor, restrictions for billboards. Uh, what we were seeing was sign spinners up and down busy streets, inflatables. So I would suggest to you the number one, uh, we have a pretty large enforcement uh, uh, for cannabis and alcohol in Washington State, the number one complaint that we got was advertising for the pub from the public. Of all the things that you think you would see, I think we were surprised to see that advertising was the biggest concern and then led to uh, further restrictions uh, uh, upon the industry. So that, that would be something that I would uh, share with you. Uh, another thing was banking. And so um, most of the states, Actually, we've been fortunate. We have three state credit unions and state uh, state chartered banks that um, that allow banking because of the way that we vet our licensees. So we go through a pretty extensive process to vet our licensees, just as we did for liquor. Uh, we go through a, a background check uh, and also fingerprint from the state patrol here in Washington State, and also through a contract with the FBI. Uh, and so we also vet not only the applicant, but the way that the initiative was written. We also vet financiers and investors. We do a financial background. We want to know where the money came uh, to establish the business. Again, trying to make sure that we keep the criminal element uh, outside this industry. And so I think I've uh, come to my seven minutes, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Both of you packed a lot of information.